Um, okay, so good evening, everyone, and um, thank you for you know being here tonight. Um, Patricia and I are excited to talk to you about marijuana policy on this appropriate day to discuss that topic. Um, raise your hand if you're high right now. <laughs> All right, we got truth tellers in the room. I like that. I like that. So I'm I'm an educator by practice. Um, I'm very passionate about critical pedagogy. Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator, who said that it's important that you don't just lecture to people, that you construct knowledge along with those in the room. This format is not really that conducive to that, so I may just ask you random questions and be like, raise your hand if you think, blah, 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 blah. So raise your hand if you're high. Thank you for those who are honest enough to tell us, and the rest of you who are lying, it's all good because, you know, it's 420. So, you know, you're going to get high off some knowledge right now, so it's all good. Um, so as Chris said, I'm, I'm a professor of um, <laughs> different classes at the new school. Most of them are about mass incarceration, young people who are caught in the criminal justice system. I'm also a director of programs at a nonprofit organization called Exalt. Um, Exalt works with 15 to 19 year olds who are in, I love how, and Chris described it perfectly, who are touched by the criminal justice system in various ways. Um, so that's anything from a felony charge that could be related to a violent assault, burglary, robbery, to a misdemeanor crime. Uh, many of our young people do come to us because of marijuana possession, hopping a turnstile. Um, raise your hand if you knew that you could go to jail for hopping a turnstile in New York City. Okay, okay, good. Raise your hand if you knew that you could go to jail for spitting on the sidewalk in New York City. Yup, yeah, mm-hmm. Have young people who have gone to Rikers Island and are in our program because they spat on a sidewalk in front of a police officer and that was the charge, right? Disorderly conduct for spinning on a sidewalk. Um, so again, so I'm gonna walk you through some of the nuances of like what we think of as progressive policy, what we think of as progressive, um, you know, environments, and, and, and what that might look like for some of the young people who are under the radar um, and living in what Michelle Alexander would call this new Jim Crow case system. But before I do that, I just wanted to start with a few clips. So, um, how many of you have seen Eugene Jarecki's The House I Live In? Oh, perfect, good, okay. So for a lot of you, this is gonna be a new experience. Um, so this film is really fascinating. This is a filmmaker out of Yale who uh, created a documentary that was instigated by a conversation that he had with this housekeeper who was a black woman who came to New Haven from Virginia and you know, he had a very close bond with this woman because, you know, she helped raise him, essentially. And he was very curious about what brought her to uh, Connecticut from Virginia. You know, what was that process like? What was that thinking like? And then also, um, she experienced a, a death. And her son was, uh, he died from a drug overdose. And another son that she had, um, had HIV, right? And so, she, she, he goes on this, Eugene Jarecki goes on this investigation to discover, you know, what does it mean to, you know, be impacted by the war on drugs or mass incarceration in these really powerful ways um, through this, this connection that he has with his, with his nanny. Um, but there's a segment in the film that's really powerful that I just want to start out with where he is looking at how drugs became illegal in America. And it's this little five minute segment that I wanted to begin with. Um, so we'll watch it and then I'll give you my commentary on it. Looking to find out more about the longer history of drugs in America, I found an unlikely source in Lincoln historian Richard Miller. His research put drug laws in a fascinating historical context. Historically, anti-drug laws have always been associated with race. In the 1800s, certain kinds of drugs that are illicit today were common in this country. Cocaine was widely used, heroin, People using drugs it was something that was just ordinarily accepted. Opium, for example, was used by middle-aged, successful whites, often housewives in the South. If people were addicted or abusing drugs, they were viewed sympathetically as people who had to be helped. It was seen as a public health issue rather than a crime issue. But one of the first changes was on the West Coast when smoking opium was made a criminal offense. 
Now, why would opium smoking be illegal in California, but not in Mississippi? What was going on in California that was a concern about smoking opium? Well, as it turns out, it had nothing to do with opium itself. The concern was with the people associated with smoking opium, and that was the Chinese who had come to this country, and many of whom were in California, working hard, working for very little pay, and becoming part of the American success story. But their success was taking jobs away from white workers. So politicians got together and decided they got to find something about the Chinese for which they can be criminalized to get them out of the way. Now, of course, you can't throw people in jail simply because they're Chinese, but you can throw them in jail because they smoke opium. In the same way, we saw things going on with cocaine. Again, it was middle-aged, successful people in this country, business executives, physicians, housewives, all perfectly legal. But then around the turn of the century, cocaine began being associated with blacks. They could withstand police bullets, it was thought. They can work hard all day, all night long, and all day long again, threatening the jobs of white workers. And so laws began to be passed against cocaine. You're not arresting these people officially because they're black. You're arresting them because they've committed some sort of drug violation. Next, of course, we see the change in reputation that hemp has had. Hemp was a legitimate crop from colonial times forward, a widely appreciated commercial product. But then in the 1930s, hemp changed into something vicious and fearsome called marijuana. Because at that time, marijuana smoking was being associated with Mexicans, working hard, working cheap. And once again, what was being outlawed was not being Mexican, but just some habit associated with Mexicans. These laws set up a very dangerous precedent of racial control. It seemed that time and again, drug laws targeted any immigrant group seen as a threat to the established economic order. But how then did black Americans, who came to this country over 200 years ago, become the primary target of drug laws in the modern era? Well, the way to think about African-American history in the 20th century. Um, really powerful film, so I suggest that you see it in its entirety if you can. Uh, it was on Netflix, but it's not anymore. I think it's on Prime now, so you can go on Amazon and get that. Like everything else in our society, it's been colonized by Amazon. Um, so for those of you who like, it was, it was kind of low, right? But you know, the, the key takeaways there are that heroin, opium, cocaine, uh, marijuana, it wasn't even called marijuana, it was called hemp. Um, these drugs were never illegal. They were part of um, common experience for Americans in our society. Um, and then, you know, xenophobic and racist politicians who wanted to address issues of immigration labeled those who use these drugs as criminals. And, and that's a common theme for our talk today. And Patricia and I are going to go deeper into that. And it, it connects directly with what Michelle Alexander talks about when she is describing how systems of social control have adapted from the Jim Crow era in you know, the uh, pre-civil rights South and the way that some of those um, elements of oppression have migrated up to you know, Chicago, New York, um, the Bay Area. You know, they, they follow those people, right? Those policies follow those people. So it becomes very important to understand the context that we have now where we continue to criminalize the people that we associate with these drugs, despite the fact that there's no clear distinction between these people and criminalization other than, than what was created by, you know, privileged folks in power, right? Um, so another great clip that I have for you, which I think is more entertaining, I think, than the other one. Um, so, uh, pop quiz. Is marijuana legal in New York City? No, decriminalized. No, decriminalized. What does it mean to be decriminalized? Uh, didn't it start with the DA saying they weren't going to prosecute, and then now it's like more like a traffic ticket kind of thing? But you can't actually like walk down the street, you can't sell it, you can't tax it, you can't like work with it in the system of the economic... Okay, yeah, so, and, and actually, um, it all kind of ground zero for this decriminalization policy is the next clip that I'm gonna show you, which is actually Mayor Bill de Blasio and Bill Bratton, the former police commissioner, um, coming out in a press conference and saying, you know, we're not going to um, 
lock up people for marijuana anymore. We're going to shift to this policy of decriminalization. I, just, I think this is hilarious. Um, have any of you seen any of this conference when it came out? We were watching this in my office in Exalt, like cracking up. Um, so here it is. This is the... How do I get back to my PowerPoint? Oh, it's down there. Okay, so this is the um, next clip I have for you, short clip. De Blasio and Braden talking about decriminalization of marijuana in New York. Anything in your pockets, they'd empty the pockets, and then they'd make an arrest for the open view, something that they had voluntarily complied with. Uh, the commissioner issued back in, I think it was 2010, 2011, a clarification that that was not to be done, that effectively that was inappropriate. That order uh, began the, the decline in marijuana arrests significantly for the open view charge. Trending down over time. I understand there are other trends underway. It's not just specific to the, uh, the policy. Similarly, as uh, we've seen this year, the uh, trending is still down by a smaller percentage, but it's down, as I just referenced as of this morning, by about another 3%. For your purposes, to give you a sense of uh, you or the public, what uh, 25 grams of uh, marijuana would look like, that's about it. And uh, so not a large amount. And the number of uh, joints, if you will, that could be made from that, that not amount varies significantly depending on how much they put in each joint. But that's uh, about, what, 25 grams. This, for uh, clear explanation purposes, is oregano. It is not marijuana. It's oregano, folks. And all I can think of right now is pizza. Not marijuana. I usually like oregano on my pizza. You're not. But, uh, so if you smell just it, oregano. Uh, that's not marijuana. But just for purposes of giving you an idea of or what so we're they talking say. about. Okay. So, so it actually so it started with that, right? And, and, and um, this was shortly after de Blasio was elected. And, and then the next step was for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and various district attorneys all over the city to get together and say, you know what, we're going to vacate these lower level offenses that are related to marijuana possession um, as long as it falls under the 25 gram distinction that they just laid out. Um, and that was significant and it's important. So we have seen some changes with marijuana policy at the city level, but we continue to see young people in the city um, in particular and adults as well being driven through the criminal justice system in very large numbers, and a lot of it is related to marijuana use. Um, and I'm gonna show you some graphs in a minute and some charts that uh, you know, convey what is happening. Um, but I have, a, I have so many anecdotal stories. I'll, I'll just tell you a couple, um, and then I'll, I'll explain like, why this is important to pay attention to. Um, in Exalt, we worked with a young man who is 17 years old. I won't tell you his name to protect his identity. Um, he was charged with gun possession. Um, he was caught allegedly carrying an unloaded weapon, um, arrested, processed, charges are brought against him. A gun possession charge in the city is a serious charge because we have a democratic controlled city council and city government and they don't play around with guns. So. You know, he was looking at five years in prison just for having this unloaded weapon. Even though he never pointed at anybody, no one got hurt or anything, just him being caught with the weapon was um, punishable by up to five years in prison. This is not a talk about gun control, so I'm not gonna get into that. This is a talk about marijuana, so let me just continue the story in that level. So he was in court, um, first charge, never got charged with anything else. Um, his mother was heartbroken. She was a single mother. Um, she relied on him for everything, from going down to the corner store, the local bodega, to pick up you know, different items for him, um, to you know, just being a system of support for her as she dealt with all of these different, difficult things that she was trying to deal with in her life. She had health issues. And so he was just such an important bedrock of their small family. And she just could not get over the fact that she could lose her son to incarceration for five years at the age of 17 that she might not see him again until he was like 22 years old. She couldn't get over that. She just couldn't deal with that. So this young man you know, had a very uh, proactive mother. Some would even say probably a helicopter mother if he had been in like the suburbs or a different community, right? And she was committed to making sure that he showed up to all his court dates, which he did, um, was able to get a plea agreement 
And, and, and mind you, um, in our criminal justice system, cases never go to trial. That doesn't happen. Not for gun possession, not for drugs, not for different types of crimes. These cases plea out more than 95% of the time, right? Which means there's some kind of agreement that's made that a young person admits guilt. And so this young person admitted guilt, regardless of whether he was actually guilty or not. He figured it's not worth trying to go to trial and fight the five years and then end up being found guilty. I'm just gonna plea out, so he did. Pled guilty, got what's called youth offender status. A youth offender status allows a person between the ages of um, 17 and 19 to be considered a youth offender, adjudicated, and not an adult. So that when you, you know, get your felony, you don't end up with a record that can then keep you from applying for jobs, voting, all these different things, right? So he did that. He got the felony plea. He got the youth, uh, the youth offender plea. He um, was then scheduled to be on probation. He met all the different needs of probation. All along this time, Exalt is working with him, helping him. He's meeting all the needs of Exalt. I'm writing letters to his uh, public defender and to the judge and to the district attorney saying, this kid is doing a phenomenal job. He's being great. Um, he got put into an, a, a program that was connected to the courts that required him to drug test. This was the final um, hurdle that he had to overcome in order to end up free and, and complete his probation. He failed a marijuana test and he got put in jail. The next day he got put in jail because he failed a marijuana test. The next day, right? Um, I wish that I could tell you that was an anomaly, but it's not. This young man did everything the system asked him to do, was a good kid, first time offender, and he failed one marijuana test and was put in jail. The judge was livid. And I sat in, in court and I listened to the judge. Again, I won't name the judge's name because <laughs> I had to protect identities in my job. Um, but the judge was livid. The judge was like, how dare you fail this marijuana test? Do you know what this means? Do you understand what you've put, what you've jeopardized in your future? You know, send them to Rikers. Send them to Rikers right now. And it's very dramatic. If any of you have ever been to court, the, the police come out and the court officers come out and they put the handcuffs on the young person and the young person is taken into a little back room not to be seen again until they get on that bus and go to Rikers Island. He had no idea that I was coming that day. No idea, no clue. We didn't either, I had no clue either. And again, I wish I could tell you that that was an anomaly, but it's not. Um, and again, it's like, and, and Patricia's gonna talk about this a little bit more as well. What was that young person doing? Self-medicating. He was under a tremendous amount of stress and pressure. It's a logical decision, if you think about it, really, <laughs> to smoke a blunt, <laughs> dealing with that level of, of, of stress and pressure, right? But instead, he was, he was sent to jail, right? So, so we continue to have a system that views punishment as the most sensible outcome for um, those who are you know, trying to, to face these issues. So some data for you, for, those, for the data people. Um, Let me, so this is not, uh, can y'all, y'all can't see this. Let me, let me explain to you what these charts are. Um, so this chart over here is from the law enforcement handbook that New York City issues every year. Um, and, you know, top level NYPD folks put this together. It's based on arrest data in the city. And then um, it's distributed, you know, in police academy and officers and sergeants look at it and they use it to patrol and to think about how they police in the city. What you're looking at here is what they call proactive offenses for drug arrests and allegations. Anybody know what that, the longest bar on that is? Shout it out if you know. The longest bar, the biggest. So these are, these are the number of arrests for drug possession or allegation of drug possession in New York City. What race do you think that, that long bar is? Black, right? Ding, ding, ding. You know, it's like, you, you know. Um, so the longest bar is black, right? The um, second longest bar, anyone want to take a guess on what? Hispanic. What do you think that little teeny tiny bar on the end is? White. <laughs> white. They don't, they don't specify by gender, but white, right? <laughs> so 
So these are, you know, these are, are you know, what arrests look like. In another report I'm going to show you in a few minutes, um, black people are nine times more likely than white people in this city, still, as of this year, to be stopped on allegations or suspicion of marijuana um, and arrested and then, you know, consequently, you know, booked if they are actually caught with it. But they use it the same race, right? And we'll talk more about that later. This, the middle chart is um, summons in New York City. So you mentioned, and, and you're exactly right, you know, now um, that the DAs have vacated and the mayor came out and said, you know, we're not going to um, dedicate resources to prosecuting marijuana uh, misdemeanor charges or felony charges anymore, the way they're dealing with this is what they call desk appearance tickets, DATs. Um, and so these are summonses. Um, the top summons in the city, it's, it's kind of light, so you can't see it, but it's for marijuana. In the fourth quarter of 2017, there were 4,544 possession of marijuana summonses issued. Nothing else in the city even comes close to that, right? Uh, federal motor vehicle is the next um, safety registration, so not having proper safety registration on your, on your vehicle um, was the next thing. And then, you know, reckless driving and so on and so forth, consumption of alcohol in public, you know, they, they fall considerably next to that. And then the final uh, graph that we have up here is how low-level marijuana possession arrests have fluctuated under various administrations, going back to the Koch administration up to the de Blasio administration. So if you look at the Koch administration, arrests were actually really low for marijuana arrests. And it's funny because, you know, anyone who's like a real New Yorker, what was Koch considered? Anybody know? Was he considered to be like liberal, progressive, conservative? Conservative, very, yeah, very conservative, right? So this was a conservative administration. Arrests were low, but it's important to note this is the 1970s, late 1970s. The war on drugs had not really amped up yet. And it definitely hadn't amped up in New York City, right? It was just starting to get amped up all across the country, and it hadn't really come home. Following uh, Mayor Koch, we have Mayor Dinkins, the, fir the first black mayor of New York City. Um, they actually increased slightly at the end of the Koch administration and then under Dinkins, but they dropped again. And then we had an explosion of marijuana arrests under Giuliani. RIP. Um, he's not dead, but you know, he's not, he's not the mayor anymore, right? So I can say that? Okay. So um, Giuliani, you know, <laughs> he put considerable law enforcement resources and attention on marijuana in the city, in addition to trying to clean up the sex clubs in 42nd Street and also the stuff that he said he was going to do, right? So um, Bloomberg came into office after him. Again, we, we saw a drop and then a rise. Um, a, a supposedly independent mayor who was not as conservative as Giuliani. And then we had de Blasio, Mr. Tale of Two Cities, Mr. Progressive Candidate, who was supposed to end these um, discrepancies and, and change these policies. And we did see a considerable, considerable drop. And so it is important to note that marijuana arrests and arrests in general are down across the city. They are. But what has not changed at all is the discrepancies between the rates that whites and blacks have been arrest, arrested. What has not changed at all is the, and you know, again, this is not a talk about, I'm also like an education um, you know, expert, and I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about education reform. High school graduation rates are higher in the city than they've ever been, 74% um, at last count, and, and rising. That's great, but guess what? Blacks and whites continue to graduate at half black, half the number of white, right? Whites are, are twice as likely to graduate as whites. Whites are twice as likely to graduate as blacks in the city. And that was the same as, as before de Blasio came into office. Um, and so we have to attack these discrepancies, right? If, if, if the arrest rates are going down, but blacks are still twice as likely to be seen as targets and put in jail, even though we're not more criminal, that's a problem. If we're getting you know, reforms and we're, we're pushing forward on some of these issues, but we're not addressing the progressives and the, the discrepancies, and that also is an issue. Okay, so um, state level. Uh, we do have a, a governor's race this year. Yeah, where are my Nixon people at? All right, there you go. Yeah, she said she's gonna legalize marijuana, we'll see. Um, where are my Cuomo people at? I was gonna say get out right now, no I'm playing. 
I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, so, you know, Cuomo has been the governor of New York for a considerable amount of time. So, you know, through the Obama administration, through, you know, uh, today, um, what we're looking at here is just arrests across the state. And, um, you know, in 2008, the year that Obama came into office, there were 578,000 arrests in New York State, total arrests. Here in 2017, the most recent year that we have data, there are 449,000 arrests. We really haven't dropped the amount of arrests that much. Um, under a Democratic governor and under a regime that, you know, we know that is, is, is conservative, but, you know, in a time span in which um, more awareness has come to the fore about marijuana use and, you know, uh, mental health and also mass incarceration and our need to address mass incarceration, not only at the national, but also at the state and local levels. Um, so one thing that I found really fascinating about this data is that, you know, continually drug crime, drug arrests continue to be high from 2008 until today. Um, and, and Michelle Alexander talks about this in the New Jim Crow. Um, the majority of our crime at the national level, at the state level, at the city level is not driven by rape, you know, burglary, murder, the sensational crimes that we hear about in the media. It's driven by low level offenses. It's driven by misdemeanors. Um, almost all crimes that are committed are misdemeanor crimes, whether by young people or adults, right? Um, and often they're property related crimes or drug crimes. And so, you know, we really need to shift the narrative and, and reconsider how we talk about crime in our society. Also, it's important to note, and we talk about this with the young people in Exalt all the time, crime has precipitously dropped since like the 1970s. And incarceration numbers have continued to multiply in, you know, the zillions, right? I mean, it's, it's insane, you know, the percentage at which um, the rate of people incarcerated in this country has grown, and crime is just going down, right? And so we have a real problem here related to design and structure that we need to address. And then if you look at the nation, um, marijuana use among 18 to 25 year olds, and, and I was just really drawn to this data because I work with young people, and um, this data only goes up to 2010, but I thought the survey was really interesting, and there are many other surveys out here that exist that are similar that whites and blacks tend to use marijuana at about the same rates. There are, there's data that says that whites overuse slightly, there's data that says blacks overuse slightly, but it all kind of levels out and we all kind of use the same race. So if marijuana is being used at the same race, if most drugs are being used at the same race, right? Um, why is it that we overrepresent so much at the city level, at the state level, and the national level in terms of criminalization and incarceration? So these are just things for us to consider and think about. And, and try to find out how to address. And then um, I think it's important to look at you know, marijuana arrests. Nationally, we do have the Trump administration in office right now. We have Jeff Sessions. They've made a stated commitment to returning to the war on drugs, returning to a failed policy. Like we've established that these policies don't work at all on any kind of level. The Koch brothers have established that these, <laughs> these things don't work. Republicans have admitted that these, these things don't work. And we have an administration right now that has said, no, we need to go back to that. We need to go do that again. Why? Right? What is going on at our national government level? What is going on at our state government level? And so we want to continue to ask you these questions and have you consider these things um, as, as we move forward. And now I'm going to ask Patricia to come up and take over from here. Uh, so as Chris um, said earlier, I am now a social worker, and I work for actually the mayor's um, project to bring mental health services to underserved communities. This is the mental health service for. So you've probably seen a lot of ads. Oh my God. Hello. You've probably seen a lot of ads on the subway about like Thrive NYC. You've probably seen a lot of ads about um, naloxone, right, to save folks because of the opioid epidemic, which is, there's a whole racialized aspect to that um, that I would like to discuss with Brian um, later on. And so the work that I do right now is at a community-based organization in Queens, and I work in an inpatient and outpatient substance use facility. Um, so we're working with people who are in active addiction and in active recovery. 
So the thing that I want to address today is really thinking about why does anybody do any kind of drug, right? Or why do people have addictions? Addictions can be anything from using substances to sex, right? Porn addiction, food addiction, shopping addiction. There are many different gambling types of addictions. So um, the thing that I want to discuss is sort of how perceptions have changed, specifically about marijuana, because I am a child of the 80s, and I remember um, the, yes, 80s, um, I remember the Bush administration and RIP, right, Barbara Bush, she's not with us any longer. Um, as a child in the living room, of my house where my parents, who are immigrants from South Korea, thought that it was really important for their children to know that they shouldn't be using drugs. Why? Because we were living in a predominantly low-income black neighborhood on one side of the street and on the other was working class, blue-collar white folks. Um, so, is it space bar to go to the next screen? Yes. I am so proud of like my little transition thing. It only happens on like one slide because I got tired of having to do it. <laughs> But, because I am no tech person. Um, okay, so it turns out that 36% in 2015 of high school seniors, according to this particular meta-analysis, um, said that mar regular marijuana use is dangerous. 52% in 2009, and then 78%, that would include me, in the early 1990s. So the clip that I want to show you is the exact cartoon that I had to watch with my parents along with all these other kids in their living rooms, right? Um, let me see if this works. Maybe. Technical help? Okay. Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue is the powerful story of a teenager dealing with drug and alcohol abuse. And some of your favorite cartoon characters will help you understand how drugs and alcohol can ruin your life. So watch the program. Talk about it with your family. And make the right decision. Stay away from drugs and alcohol. Already? <sighs> I was smurfing like a baby. <gasps> Great Smurfs! Corey's piggy bank is gone. Hey, what the hell? Hey, what's the problem? Who smurfed the bell? Hurry, my little Smurfs. Corey's been robbed, and we must wake her up. You want to help track down the thief, Garfield? Hey, going through life with a blue lampshade is work enough. Wake me when the lasagna comes. Let me rephrase that. Do you want to help, or do you want to be lunch? My luck to be stuck on a dresser with a pushy alien. Opportunity to be of service. But where's Alvin? Alvin! Busy! There's someone who needs your help! What? Another autograph hound? Come on! Hey! Wait a minute! Put me down! Steady, my little smurfs! Steady! Oh, oh, oh. 
Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm not late for breakfast, am I? Oh, Pooh. It's perfectly obvious we're trying to wake Cory up, but we're not trying hard enough. Come on down there, you're not pushing. Ah! <laughs> oh, think, think, think. Perhaps if we wake up Kermit, Kermit will wake up Cory. <laughs> Sheesh, I hate when that happens. set the alarm on a Saturday. Huh? Ah. Okay, all of that is to say, it's ruined like every single classic 80s cartoon um, because of the Bush administration, right? Forever ruined everything for me. So um, this goes on for like 30 minutes and it's about this girl's older brother who steals her money to buy pot. And she catches him in his bedroom. She's like, what's wrong with your eyes? You know, like he's got the, the eye thing happening. And, and then he's in a crowd of kids who are all doing pot. And then remember, marijuana, everybody, is the gateway drug. And so in that crowd of folks, they're doing like crack cocaine. I mean, they just start going nuts, right? This is on YouTube. Go and watch it. I had to when I was eight, eight years old, right? And then what's hysterical is, in high school, I was in a driver's ed, and one morning, because the, the guy who was um, the instructor needed an enormous, like, 50-ounce cup of coffee from 7-Eleven or something, and it's like 7 in the morning before school. And I remember this kid sitting in the front seat, and he turned around and opened his hand while the guy was in the, in the shop, and there were like three joints. And he was like, yo you want one of these? And in my mind, I was like, holy shit. The stuff on the TV happens in real life, <laughs> right? Where like the kids come and they offer you the drugs. Uh, I won't tell you what happened after that, but <laughs> that is a true story from my own life. Um, okay, so. The thing that I really want to talk about um, is the relationship between mental health and physical health specifically. Um, so smoking pot or really smoking cigarettes, why do we do it? What are we trying to relieve? Stress. Stress. Very good. Uh, so can anybody guess the top four causes of death according to the lovely Center for Disease Control in 2016? Heart disease, yes. Cancer. Cancer. Suicide. Suicide, okay, yes. Car accidents. Car accidents. Ah, okay. So this is a thing that I want us to talk about because when we look at statistics, we don't necessarily think about the breakdown. When we look at people who die from heart disease, which is actually by far and away the one that kills Americans the most. Next comes cancer, then chronic lower respiratory disease that includes COPD, emphysema, cigarette smokers. Uh, and number four is the unintentional, specifically for us, drug overdose, okay? Thinking about the common denominator, stress. And what's really important for all of us to understand about our mental health is that when we feel stressed, it actually affects us physically. And stress comes in a myriad of different fashions. And this is a thing that a lot of people don't necessarily understand um, because they're not necessarily educated around that. So a lot of the work that I do as a therapist um, is educating individuals who don't really necessarily understand the connection between traumatic experiences and the stress that comes from those and their physical health, right? And a lot of us don't understand that trauma can be defined also in a myriad of different ways. Trauma doesn't look the same from person to person because we have different levels of resiliency too. So the thing that I want to talk about um, is a study that's become very popular. I believe Oprah has lauded this and anything that Oprah lauds turns into like a microphone into like the galaxy, three galaxies down, right? So she talks on her show about this study um, 
about adverse childhood experiences. So this chart, um, you can't really see it, is really thinking about at the very bottom when we've experienced something in our childhood, the ways in which that actually echoes out over the course of our lives. If we go on to the next slide, uh, the ACEs questionnaires, about 10 questions, right? And it comes out of the Kaiser Permanente um, study, research study. So uh, it utilized data on 17,000 members. It was an HMO. Anybody know what HMO stands for? Yes, my goodness, just... Most people don't even know that. Versus PPO, right? Preferred provider. So HMO means people were getting their care generally within the same system. So the information, the data that they were mining was pretty comprehensive. Okay. So 17,000 people. Um, and they were asking questions like, have you experienced psychological abuse? Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Did you live with anyone who was using drugs, drinking? Did a household member go to prison? That's four out of the 10. For each one that people would say yes to would increase the likelihood of negative things happening to their physical health over the course of their life. We're gonna talk about why. Um, so before I talk about the statistics here, the Kaiser Permanente study was done actually out of accident. So in San Diego, which is a very happy place, right? When you think San Diego, what is the thing? It's Anchorman, right? San Diego is like the whale's vagina. Somebody still needs to explain this metaphor to me. I don't understand it. But it's supposed to be a very happy place, right? Where the, the quality of life is pretty good. People are employed, people are educated, and there's sunshine all the time, okay? So there was an obesity clinic um, being run within the Kaiser Permanente system. And one particular doctor was trying to figure out why people who were morbidly obese were talking three, four, five hundred pounds or more, were in this program, would lose, they would progress in the program. They would lose maybe one, two hundred pounds and then suddenly disappear, gone. They would not come back. And he couldn't figure out why, because the attrition rate, it turned out, was like 50%. That's a lot of people, right? Half the folks would just leave. So one day, um, as he was still trying to figure out this issue, he was giving a woman an assessment. One of the questions he was supposed to ask was, how old were you when you had your first sexual experience? But he misspoke. And he actually instead asked, how much did you weigh, because he's at an obesity clinic, when you had your first sexual experience. And the woman answered him. She said, 40 pounds. And he was like, that doesn't make any sense. So he asked it actually again. And she repeated herself, 40 pounds, but then she gave context. She said, I was five, right, when my dad raped me. And so then it occurred to him, we don't ask questions about trauma psychological, physical, sexual. And it turned out there was a high rate of sexual abuse in the folks that were coming for obesity maintenance and management, weight management. And when he was interviewing further, they would say things like, well, I eat because I'm taking care of my emotional self. I have to eat because it makes me feel better, right? A kind of, this leads into why people use substances. And then also thinking about the fact that these people were putting on literally body armor. Women would say, I'm invisible to men. I will not be re-victimized because men don't want a fat woman. Young men who grew up to be obese were talking about the fact that they had been bullied because they were small. But now that they were big dudes, nobody wanted to fuck with them. Pardon my French. Right? And this became um, the ACEs study. So now... Uh, the results. Two-thirds of the 17,000 people had an ACE score of at least one, right? And almost 90% of those had more than one. And for each additional score, this means, again, your health issues begin to rise. So 
Uh, some examples, the likelihood of chronic pulmonary lung disease increases almost 400%. Hepatitis, 240%. Hepatitis is commonly caused by what? Yeah, it's an inflammation of the liver, right? So you're drinking a lot. Depression, 460%. And then this part is powerful, suicide, over 1,000%. So it turns out that the number hovers around three or four when it jumps exponentially. And this is a thing that we still have to undo the stigma around. The idea that we have to be able to reflect on ourselves, right, and identify areas of our life that are affecting the way that we are, how we behave, who we are to other people, because we have developed ways to protect ourselves, right? Wear different masks in order to function in different spaces. So the thing to note at the very bottom that I've included is that the members um, whose data were mined were mostly white, middle and upper middle class, college educated people in San Diego. They were all well employed and they all had good health insurance. Because a lot of people who initially hear this information think, oh, it must be low income, communities of color. No, these are the rates in white, well off, generally, in our middle class, upper middle class population. And so this is the thing that is really powerful to think about, because if that's what we know, then what do we need to understand about other communities? Right? So as um, Brian stated, historically, rates of marijuana use are higher in white populations than in black populations. But that difference began to shrink in the 90s. And research, because I've read a lot of papers, and actually it's driving me crazy. I have so many paper cuts, right, because I print all these papers. Research has shown that chronic stress and cumulative trauma of living in violent neighborhoods is related, because water is wet, to marijuana use in low-income urban black neighborhoods. There is palpable empirical data to show this. It also suggests that interventions aimed at reducing pot pot use, in urban black neighborhoods should address drug activity, violence, crime, and poverty, systemic change. The thing that's really important to note is that we have to look at a more historical and longitudinal lens. When we think about the racialized policy of the United States, that actually begins with the US Constitution. Right? We're talking about a document that has been around for a really long time, that it turns out we can't get rid of because it's sitting behind like 20 inches of bulletproof glass in the Capitol building, right? And that all we have managed to do is amend and amend and amend, and not really thinking about how we pull problems out by the roots and learn how to imagine something completely different, right? Not going back to old policies that we know don't work. But there's something about the unknown. And just on a micro level, at an individual level, not knowing is a huge source of anxiety. When we don't know the outcome, we don't want to deal with it. So the thing that I work a lot with um, the folks that I spend my time with is why do we tend to put ourselves back into traumatic situations? Right. Most commonly, we see this in inter, um, intimate partner violence relationships. Why do we keep choosing the same people to be in a relationship with? Right. One of the fundamental reasons, it turns out, is that we know what's going to happen. We know this already. And whether or not it is bad for us, we're still going to do it because that is what we know. Our job as human beings, because we have the brain capacity to do this, is to go beyond knowing and knowledge and dive into understanding. So when we think about the Constitution, uh, it was written by a lot of older white men. Right? Say that again? Yeah, white dudes. Dudes, yeah. Um, and they're living in a time where they're trying to eke out independence for themselves. 
And the thing about the Constitution is when it's ratified, it's only ratified by nine states. Nine, not states, I'm sorry. Nine colonies out of the original 13. Right, and they needed to meet that minimum quota because they couldn't get everybody to agree. So they had to make concessions. The major concession for ratification was so that certain states could keep, guess who? Slaves. They would never, ever have gotten that document ratified if they did not make that concession. Right, because they were states that wanted representation. In order to get that, they needed to include their slaves as three-fifths of one person. There weren't a whole lot of white people in the states. There were many more slaves. And the way to look at, at that sort of in our contemporary sense is that when you look at prisons and the way that the government uh, sends out their funding to their states, because we live in a federalist society, right? All of our states sort of have their own government. It turns out that the bodies in the prisons, though they cannot vote, though they are not civilly active or civically engaged, I should say, they still count in the census. So that means more bodies, more money. But none of that money is actually going to these folks in the rehabilitation, no. Because we come from this curious place where in order to rehabilitate criminals, we have to see them like people ourselves like us. But you have a lot of folks who say, oh my God, like I am $50,000 in debt and this person is getting a free education? It's not fair. When we think about just desserts, we are talking about something very old. How many of you are familiar with Hammurabi? The Code of Hammurabi, an eye for an eye? That shit is from like the 17th century BCE, okay? You wanna talk about not letting things go? We have not let that go. <laughs> hmm. And that's something powerful to think about. Because the thoughts that we have, if you're not actually thinking about where they're coming from, can you really claim them as your own? Right? When you say you take accountability, who are you taking accountability for? Right? And that's not necessarily the conversation that we always have. Um, one other piece that I want to talk about is this idea that, and Michelle Alexander talks about this, at the rate that we have been going and continue to go, one in three black men are going to end up in jail or prison. One in three. And it turns out the African American population in the United States is less than 15% of the total number of people, at least according to the census. And yet they make up 40% of the folks who are being sent away. On Rikers Island alone, you have what, like 8,000 people, 8, 9,000 people? 79, 80% are there because they can't pay bail. Sometimes bail is only like $200. And if you think about the times that you get takeaway and all this other stuff, $200 is like that, gone. People are sitting in Rikers, experiencing severe trauma because they can't pay that. Then you gotta think about 40% of the people on Rikers who are actually there because they are suffering from a mental illness. That number, about 40%, is equal to the total number of people in every hospital institution, mental health institution in New York. So Rikers Island doubles as a psych ward, 40%, right? And many of them are there because they're homeless. They were arrested because they were not taking their medication. Why? Because they were seeing a psychiatrist one time for 15 minutes once a month. And they're not getting education around why they should be taking their medication. In fact, it turns out there are high rates of diagnoses of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, very severe mental illness for particularly black folks. I have seen women come in who have been saddled with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, been medicated for it, and I'm thinking, 
they started seeing things or experienced suicidal ideation right after they had their first or second child. So for women who are experiencing desperately depressive thoughts after they have their children, what do we usually call that? Postpartum depression. But there is postpartum psychosis. But because a psychiatrist only sees somebody for 15 minutes, they do not have time to sit there and talk. They just don't. And now you have folks who are sitting in places like Rikers Island where you know those correctional officers, they do not double as social workers. They are not trying to understand any of these folks. And it gets even more complicated because we have correctional officers of color who themselves come from traumatic backgrounds and who are unable to communicate with the very people who look like them, come from their communities. And so thinking about really what our role is here, why systemic change is integral, integral, integral is my like uh, high school math camp days is like just always in the, f in the forefront of my brain. Um, Asian, stereotype, some are true. So uh, why it's integral. One literary example I can give you is Thomas More's Utopia. When we think about the word utopia, what do we think? Well, you, sir, gold star. But most people think good place, right? When we think about a utopia, we think about paradise, the perfect place. But for more, he was smart. He was using sort of this double entendre where the good place was really no place, meant the same thing, right? And he's trying to make an argument about the fact that early stages of capitalism are beginning to take hold all over Europe. People are beginning to privatize land. Folks who used to subsist on that land were now being kicked out and didn't have any papers to prove that they, for generations in their family, were on that land. They didn't. And so he was watching sort of the ways in which that was ravaging society. And he gives one very poignant example that people who were picking pockets were being hung publicly. Right? And why would you hang anybody publicly? Why would you have any kind of public execution? What is the point of that? Yeah, you want to prevent others from doing it. It's a preventative measure. It turned out that for like the eight people who were being hung for picking pockets, their compatriots were in the crowd picking their pockets. So the point that Moore was trying to make is something is wrong here. We're punishing people and yet the crime is not going away, right? And that has to do with systemic issues. If you are poor and you have to feed your family, you're gonna steal because you have no other way to do this. In this country, we are talking about a lot of folks who have low wage jobs. You can't afford insurance. You can't afford rent. You can't afford food. There are so many things that people are without and that they will do in order to survive. At any rate, uh, I think I want to bring Brian up here so that we can just sort of have a larger conversation and any questions that you might have or things that you guys want to talk about, um, we should totally do. Yeah. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Um, my question is, uh, what's going on with the, in NYC, what's going on with pot that's different with de Blasio? Um, just in a, a practical kind of situation, just how is it, how is it spell out? Um, well, there's a lot of different ways to answer that. I think, um, you know, arrests are down, and so you, you heard um, Patricia say that the number of people in Rikers Island is lower than it's ever been. 
Um, that's not only about marijuana, that's also about crime in general. That is about um, policing taking a shift and district attorneys moving away from seeing incarceration as um, the best way to deal with crime and, and thinking about diversion programs like Exalt. I mean, Exalt is essentially, it, the program that I work for is essentially a diversion program. So um, there, there has been a shift under the Blasio administration and, and I do wanna acknowledge that. Um, in regards to your question about like, well, what does it look like if you are stop and frisk, for example, let me just take that since you brought it up, I think it's great. Um, stop and frisk, so again, the numbers of arrests are down, so random numbers of stop and frisks in this city have dropped under de Blasio, that is true. Um, that being said though, police still have discretion to use stop and frisk as a tactic, and they do. Um, and in fact, I was at a conference two weeks ago and one of the head NYPD strategists was saying, you know, people wanna act like stop and frisk is an illegal thing to do, but it's not. We can do stop and frisk in um, ways that are not racially exclusive. This is a black woman who said this. <laughs> and everyone in the crowd, was just kind of, it was a mostly black crowd, it was like, oh, did she just say that? That's crazy, right? But, um, but I think that is, that is the strategy of community policing under Bill de Blasio, right? We're not going to get rid of stop and frisk necessarily. What we're going to do is to try to stop doing it in a racially biased way. Um, and that's sort of the retraining that the police have been getting. Um, and so anyone who's like, do we have any police officers in the room or district attorney folks? I feel like you'd be afraid to say it after this talk, right? You could, you fine. like it's a safe space. Um, so anyone who, who is in law enforcement or you know, has worked in law enforcement knows that police can use these sort of random patterns of search and seizure and it's constitutional, it's legal. So if you, if you go to a train station and you see the police with their table and they're checking bags, there's a system to that. If you, if you get stopped um, you know, for driving your car down the street and you see police you know, pulling over cars, they're not pulling you, I mean, it can feel like, I know because I'm a black man that drives a car sometimes. I don't drive one in New York, but in Chicago I'm always driving, right? So I know it can feel like, oh, I just got pulled over because I'm black. But the, the police must have, in order for them to not have a civil rights case brought against them, they must have a system of stopping every fifth person. They've already determined that. So they're saying like, go, 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 stop. Go, 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 stop. That's what's happening at train stations as well with like bags and stuff, right? And so as long as they're using that random system of stopping, it's constitutional and it's legal. Those kind of things continue to happen with the NYPD, right? The, the systemic issue though, which de Blasio has not addressed, and, and this is what I want those in the audience to think about, and whoever our next mayor is, and you know, you know, all of us have you know, voting ability, I hope, and can exercise this, is that people get arrested where the police go. So where do the police go? They go to Bed-Stuy. They go to Far Rockaway. They go to, I mean, they go, I mean, it's crazy. Like our city's being so heavily gentrified and so quickly gentrified. You know, bed is not even Bed-Stuy anymore, right? Like the Rockaways ain't Rockaways anymore. But police are going to areas where they believe there are high rates of crime. Where do they believe there are high rates of crime? P areas where there are black, Hispanic, and low-income people. And so de Blasio has not changed that policy. He continues to send police in very high numbers. And by the way, the NYPD is like the, the highest, the biggest police force on the planet. It rivals some like, I don't have the exact number. Do you know how many people are in the NYPD? I think it's like 8,000 or something like that. There are, small, there are small armies of countries that have smaller personnel or equal sized personnel to um, the NYPD. So he continues to send officers on the street to black neighborhoods, Hispanic neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods. And so we continue to see more arrests in those areas. But imagine, I mean, Michelle Alexander has this moment in this book, and you know, I'm not gonna read from this book, but it's here, you all should check it out. But it's such a brilliant moment. She's like, just imagine if police raided college dorm rooms. Imagine, right? Imagine if they went to you know, wealthy uh, white neighborhoods like Westchester or Chappaqua, right? And, and decided, I'm just gonna randomly, I'm a, we're gonna bring the SWAT team into this house or this room and start, you know, what would they find? We know, right? I mean, you know, like we know what they'll find, right? But, you know, they don't, they don't do that. They continue to, to do the things that, that they're doing. So I think in order for us to like shift how we look at um, policing, it, we have to go beyond just like community policing as de Blasio is calling it. And we really have to radically shift 
the way we think about crime in our society, which I think is also what Patricia was asking us to do. Thank you, 34,000, yes. That puts it in perspective even more. Thank you. I was really struck by the conversation about like the mechanism towards this all happening, so the idea of like having physical or emotional trauma relate to later choices and like the things that you're asking me. But like, I, I felt like there was this bit of commentary about isolation, like social isolation, and then solitary confinement like as a cause and consequence hear what your thoughts are about the idea that like when we are isolating a, a subset of possible mentors from a group, then generationally they're going to continue to have lost their, and then you're going to feel more alone, and then you might turn more, this lack of education and these ideas that might lead you more towards trauma, and then you're in jail, and you're alone, and you're scared, and that kind of thing, and like how do we, how do we like use this knowledge that it causes Are you here now? That's part of it. Um, and this is a question probably, it's much more complicated to answer because it's overwhelming to think about systemic change. Actually, let me get to the last slide. Um, it is very overwhelming to think about systemic change because at the end of the day, we wanna think that we are choosing, right? that we are free to choose because the American dream is you work really hard and you do whatever the hell you want to do, right? You can achieve the American dream. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps is the famous line. Turns out originally that the phrase pull yourself up by the bootstraps really meant something was completely impossible. But it's come to mean we can do anything, right? What? And so, uh, this is what um, the work should look like at an individual level. It's beginning to think because we all come from different experiences. And so using our own perspective and what we know, what does it look like on a one-to-one -one level in terms of conversation that you have with other people, right? Like, oh, you know, I really hold, like I'm holding on to this thing that that random person said, this thing that I went to on 420, like let me look into that. Right? And what is it that I can do on my social media or whatever it is to sort of spark education with other people? Because as insidious as social media is, because I think I shut down my Facebook like two years ago or something, but um, it can be used to spread knowledge so that other people can feel like connected to a tribe of folks. Because we are not always gonna meet people that we agree with. In fact, you shouldn't always meet people that you agree with because then you silo yourself and that's isolating too, right? It's really understanding the other person's perspective. How is it that I can imagine that other person, even if they are diametrically opposed to everything that I believe in, every single fiber of what I believe in, that's really important. And on an individual level, that's your power, right? That you can actually hold those conversations because many people walk away and then you just never understand each other and you will never have another conversation again. When in effect, it's totally also possible that if you went one or two words further, you could begin to learn so much more about this other person, if that makes sense, right? Um, so that's like totally an ambiguous answer but it's meant to be, because it's asking all of us to think, how do we do it differently? I'm now like half a million dollars in debt because first I went for an MFA, and then I did the MSW because this is what this work means to me. Not everybody's gonna do that because they're not crazy like that, you know? But I am, and it gives me an opportunity, it affords me the opportunity to be able to come into these spaces, meet amazing people, so that we can talk about what's important to us and how that shifts over the course of our life, right? We're inconsistent creatures. We change our minds every day. One day you love vanilla ice cream and the next day you don't because that horrible person on the subway was eating vanilla ice cream when they puked all over you, you know? 
like, I know, it almost sounds real, not real, but <laughs> thinking about our own inconsistent thoughts, right? And this is why it's so powerful to have these conversations, especially with people who don't agree with you, because you never know exactly how little it might take to get somebody to think differently. It might not take very much at all, right? So I, I hope that sort of answers your question, maybe a little bit. Well, yeah. Hi, I'm holding a mic, so I'm going to talk into it. Um, thanks so much for putting on this presentation. You guys were great. Um, my name is Lindsay. I work in um, reproductive health and reproductive justice. And um, thanks. That is 100 times more applause than I've ever gotten. So thank you. Um, <laughs> um, wow. Really pushing the numbers tonight. Um, so I was just wondering, um, kind of in the wake of, uh, in, in uh, y'all's experience, in the wake of decriminalization, um, one of the tenets of reproductive justice is being able to raise your families in uh, communities free of violence. Um, and, and kind of in the wake of decriminalization, like what, have you seen any um, ch uh, shifts in, in community and have you seen any real um, impactful changes yet in terms of arrest or in terms of um, just bringing black men back into the family structure? Um. So, um, since decriminalization, I have seen some changes. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, so the other, the other text that I was going to bring tonight that I didn't, but I think is also worth investigating, um, but which drives my students insane, is Foucault's Discipline and Punish. My students hate when I ask them to read that. And my, because I'm also training staff at Exalt, I ask the direct service staff, the direct line staff, to read that as well. And they also hate me for that. Um, but you know, Foucault is, is asking us to consider, and along with Michelle Alexander, I think they're kind of doing similar work, of how systems change and how they um, adapt, especially systems of like social control and oppression. And so it's so tricky, right, because like, so yes, I've seen um, young black men um, get outcomes that are more restorative in the sense that um, they took into consideration a letter that I wrote to a judge. And maybe, you know, before decriminalization or maybe even before, and it's not just decriminalization, right? I think in general, um, our criminal justice system is beginning to move away from this idea, or at least we were beginning to move away from this idea that incarceration, punishment, restriction was the best thing to do for most people. And you know, thank God Michelle Alexander has helped us make that pivot and shift. Vice Media has helped us to make that shift. Like I said, like the Koch brothers, I mean, it's, it's crazy like the, the, the um, you know, um, alignment of interests that have come together to help push forward this issue that like incarceration does not help people, it actually hurts them, it makes, it makes communities worse. Um, so, so yes, I have seen some improvement and, and, and all of that is, I think, part of awareness. You know, I think that is part of like the way people are beginning to open up and think about restorative justice outcomes, to think about what crime really is and what it does and, and who is really being harmed. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, when you have a, a marijuana arrest or a drug possession arrest, that's usually consensual activity, right? And so who's really being harmed by that? I think most of us can agree that if, if crime is about harm, and we all want to do harm reduction in our communities and our society, even if that person is guilty of the crime, why put them in jail? Right? And I think we are starting to see judges, district attorneys, and, and different folks wake up to that. Um, and we're starting to see some outcomes that aren't including Rikers Island. But I want us to keep our eye on the ball as we think about that as well. Because um, one thing I didn't really talk about tonight, which comes up all the time in my daily work, is closing Rikers Island. Um, We've been talking about it a lot. The mayor says he can do it in three years. The governor says he can do it. Oh no, the governor says we could do it in three years. The mayor says we could do it in 10. Um, you know, um, like Patricia said, the amount of people on Rikers Island, it fluctuates daily because as we speak, there are mostly black and brown men being arrested and taken to Rikers right this minute, like right now, maybe even on this block outside here, right? Um, 
So that number is always fluctuating and people being taken into the island on intake and there are people being released. But the average number has been for the last few months around between eight and 9,000. That number is, is lower than it was when decriminalization started. When, de when the decriminalization policy was rolled out, the average number of people on Rikers Island was around 14,000. So you, you can say, you know, um, decriminalization along with other more progressive policies like community policing, like the way that we re-strategize how we do law enforcement has helped to, to drop the number of arrests. We could say that. Um, but here's the problem. You know, they want to close Rikers Island and they want to build more jails. We're not talking about closing Rikers Island and like having community centers, right? We're not talking about closing Rikers Island and doing more restorative justice or having more diversion. We're saying, let's close Rikers Island. Let's, there's, there's another thing called raise the age that's happening. So, you know, in New York, 17-year-olds um, and 16-year-olds are seen as adults in the criminal justice system for very minor crimes. So if you're 16 years old and you um, steal candy from a candy store, I'm not being hyperbolic, like seriously. This, again, something that kids come into exalt for. You will go to an adult jail. You will go to Rikers Island for stealing candy from a store, right? At 16 years old, 17 years old. So we finally woken up to that in New York State um, last year as part of the state budget. They included a, a little small portion of the budget that said we must raise the age of criminal responsibility from 16 to 18. Because that's ridiculous. Because if you're 16 and you do that, you're operating from a child's mindset, right? And so that was good, that's progress. So we should clap for that and that's great. North Carolina was the only other state that did that, by the way. <laughs> we, were the, we were the last two states in the union to, to, to get this legislation passed. So that is progress. So now the conversation comes because now we've gotten that as part of the budget. And so we said, okay, no more 16 year olds in adult jails. We're not gonna do it, it's bad for them, it's bad for their development. So where are the 16 year olds gonna go? If we get all the 16 year olds off Rikers Island, which by October of this year, every 16 year old has to be off Rikers Island, where are they gonna go? Well, they're gonna go to a youth detention center, either in Brooklyn or in the Bronx. This has already been decided. And guess what? The adult corrections officers from Rikers are gonna go to those youth detention centers and, and be with them in the youth detention centers instead of youth workers, people like me and Patricia, right, who work with young people or understand these issues. So that is a problem. Like, that is a really serious problem. We're not talking about that. You know, we're not having those conversations in our city. And so, you know, we are seeing progress. Arrests are down. Like, we're doing some things. We, we got raise the age passed. This is good. I want to continue to build on the things that we're doing. Um, but we have to have that conversation, too, about how we're continuing to not even do harm reduction, but, like, harm. Um, people who are connected to, you know, these policies. Hi, thank you both so much for this. Um, one of the things, <clears throat> one of the things I'm really concerned about is how conversations about, you know, people who end up in jail because of drug use or low-level offenses is dominating what people talk about when they talk about what's wrong with the criminal justice system. And in order to actually eradicate mass incarceration, we need to reconceptualize how we see violent crimes and what the possibilities are for alternatives to incarceration. And so I'm wondering what your, both of your thoughts are and how we can reframe the discussion to be more about than just like, it's 420, we all smoke weed, weed is okay, people shouldn't be in jail for weed, to their much broader issues with like even violent crimes, why people end up in the justice system and how that's all related. <laughs> all right. Um, actually, there's a quote uh, for this talk by Emil Durkheim. How many of you are familiar with Emil Durkheim? One of the founding fathers of sociology as an academic discipline. Um, so he states uh, that Really, we do not condemn it because it is a crime, but it is a crime because we condemn it. What he is speaking to is this idea of a collective consciousness, right? That over the years, as you study different cultures and throughout history, we are looking at the ways in which the way that we define things as a society change. And so thinking about, um, say, Angela Davis, right? Our prison's obsolete. It's a wonderful book. 
she points out something very salient and powerful. Um, she's talking about the fact that we lived in a country where nobody could imagine their life without slavery, right? And we're talking now, we can't imagine what it would be like with no jails or prisons. And so thinking about the mechanics of that is really important. This is also connected to, uh, again, this idea of the Constitution, the document that we have been writing for hundreds of years and not gotten off of, right? We just keep like putting on more sunscreen and continue to ride the thing, okay? Why it's important to think of it that way? Because once it was ratified in 1788, one year later, though Thomas Jefferson didn't have anything to do with writing the Constitution, he did mentor James Madison, who did have a hefty hand in writing the Constitution, along with some other folks. And he writes a letter to Madison because Jefferson was having a good time in, in Paris, uh, specifically. And he was saying, as an Enlightenment philosopher, right, because if we know anything about the Enlightenment movement, we are talking about people who are now attached to empirical science, science at the time. People who were talking about mathematics, logic, rational thinking. And he says to Madison something very important. In this letter, he's talking about, oh, we shouldn't owe, uh, we shouldn't pay back the debt that we owe England. But there's this other thing that's also really important to think about, that the Constitution should expire every 19 years, right? 19 years is really effectively for us one what? generation. And he actually gives pretty good, solid reasoning for that, right? He argues that no subsequent generation should ever be held to any previous generation and their context, right? Because the earth belongs to the living. But we are still writing a document that was written by men who are long dust, so this is the thing for all of us to think about, because a lot of people don't know that. That Jefferson, who is saying this, I would argue, because the man had, and we had this discussion um, not that long ago, the man had six children with Sally Hemings. Sally Hemings came over when Jefferson married his wife, Martha, right? She was an infant and her property. Sally was his wife's half-sister, because Sally was the daughter of his wife's father and a slave. And when Jefferson, as a rational, thinking man, is looking around the landscape, he sees that he is not the only one. And so now you've got to think, for those of you who are mathematically inclined out there, we begin to extrapolate into the future. Not only is the environment, but the people are changing. And at the time, he's really kind of at the apex of his political career, so he is not going to say things that are decidedly unpopular in that cultural climate. But we are at a juncture, at least now, where we can talk about things more in the open, where people are beginning to empower themselves. So this is the thing to think about, because Jefferson is also um, hearkening to... Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the father of the social contract, right? He also writes a book, which he considers his most important book, Emile, or On Education. He writes essentially a manual about how to raise a good human being, in particular a man. You should read it because it's funny how he thinks you should raise a good woman. It's really how to raise a good wife for said man, okay? But again, we're talking about like the 1750s, whatever. So... Thinking about what he says in the opening, he says that people are asking him all the time, how do we fix a fucked up education system? Because believe it or not, in the 18th century, education was fucked up then too, right? And he says, you know, it, it's very strange because no matter how many good things you throw at an already corrupt system, anything good will still get corrupted. So it defeats the purpose. And that education in one country is not going to work in the next country, in the next, in the next, in the next. And that unfortunately, as grown men, we are too busy looking for men in children rather than thinking about what children are fit to learn as kids. 
And so it is very important that these conversations happen, especially amongst folks who have all come to the same place, right? Taking an opportunity to get to know other folks who might be interested in saying the things that they feel, which are completely valid because that's your experience, right? Nobody can tell you differently about what you experience. It's incumbent upon other people to listen and learn. Yeah. Does that answer the question? I like, it's been a long day. Yeah, no, I mean, that was great. And I, I'd also say that um, that's something we think about a lot in Exalt. So that's a great uh, question, just briefly. Um, we ask our young people to reconceptualize that for themselves. And also, I think they have the most powerful things to say about what that means. Um, and so, you know, um, I think it's important that we center their voices in that conversation um, and just continue to, you know, hear from them. And so when you think, like, the, the way our, our nonprofit is set up is to not only, you know, provide a platform and a space where they can learn and speak truthfully about that precise thing, about, you know, what does it mean to, to get a label that doesn't really speak to all of your existence and dehumanizes you. How do you speak back to that? But then also we connect with other um, businesses and other individuals in the city to, to have them mentor these young people and like work with them in internship experience and opportunities. And then they begin to reconceptualize their stereotypes about those young people as well. So, you know, that's like, that's the work that we need to do, you know? And it's like, if you, if you, don't, if you don't have an organization that you can connect to, to get beyond your blind spots about what you conceive of around, you know, the stereotypes of violence or criminality, um, then you could find one, you know. Um, or you should just like, you know, I think I think thinking about it is important. I think you also need to, you know, take that step to activate and like get involved and and do something to connect with an organization that's doing that work. Um, and and think about like voting as well as a part of that. Um, which I mentioned, right? It's like we don't we don't talk about, um, you know, district attorneys as elected officials, judges as elected officials. They are, um, and so you know, they're you know, and Michelle Alexander also says in his book, the district attorney is the most powerful person in the legal system, which was like mind blowing to me because I thought it was a judge <laughs> before. You know, I mean, I think as as children we all think judges are the most powerful people. They have the Ngalbi trust thing above them. They're wearing the robes. You know, they get the TV shows that are really cool, right? Like Judge Mathis and all this stuff. So, um, you know, but prosecutors are like the ones, right? They like, they make all the pertinent decisions. They decide what to charge, when to charge, how much to charge, how little to charge. I'm not gonna charge at all. I think this is a great kid. Prosecutors have a lot of power. And, and so they really set policy around like how we see violence in a lot of ways. Along with the media, which I'm not even like getting into the media. That's like a whole nother olio. So Chris, and David will have us back and we'll, uh, you know, do another one, you know, on media and, and reconceptualizing that. That's a great question. Good luck with the speed answer for this one. Thank you for giving me the time. Um, okay, I, I'm going to ask a ask a question that's gonna be helpful to hear, helpful for me personally to hear your answer, and I think also helpful for everyone in the room. Um, so, okay, I'm sitting here with all of my privilege and also as a person who is queer and a black woman and really wanting to do racial justice work in the world, and given everything that was just said and everything that I know to be true, I know that there is a high risk for one, like trauma happening in my life, like just by doing that work and being aware of the need for it. And also, um, I feel like the, it's always gonna be something, a lot of this social change that we've been talking about, I feel like it's always gonna be something where I have to cater to white people or cater to white men or cater to whatever that majority is to shift that social contract and shift what the we is perceiving to be a crime or whatever it is. Um, and I imagine that somewhere in your work you're also coming up against um, a similar kind of majority um, who may be on your side or whatever, but like always fighting against that or 
I don't know if it's fighting against, but always working with that personally and then also in that greater movement and shift and reimagining that you've been talking about. So my question is, how do you manage that? Um, and, and maybe are there other ways that you imagine it or that you see it or that you kind of, t what other kind of story might you tell yourself in order to continue on with that work? And I think that that's important, an important question because like I said, I think I want to hear that answer as advice and, and also I really want the white people in the room and maybe other people to recognize that that struggle is happening at all times, even if we're all in the room trying to do similar work. Okay, um, thank you. No, yes. <laughs> uh, June Jordan, Audre Lorde, James Baldwin, um, this stuff, it gives me life, like good literature, um, it makes me feel good about who I am and validates me and reaffirms my identity in ways that don't make me feel like I have to, you know, cow to like anyone else's definitions of who I am. That's straight Audre Lorde, right? <laughs> She's like, you can't just, you know, collapse yourself in other people's definitions of you or you'll be destroyed. So, um, so all of that life affirming literature, plus I love to play basketball. So that's like a good release for me. <laughs> um, and that's it. I know, right? I'm not good at speed answers ever, right? If you notice anything about the talk tonight, any of my answers is not going to happen. But what I will say um, is literature has always been a comfort. So if you think about trauma, just trauma, period. Before trauma was a word and is now all over the place, people have been traumatized since people have been around, right? Because you got to think that we are all products of trauma in some way, shape, or form. And it's important to hold on to that. Why? Because human beings have the incredible and incredibly nasty capability of hurting one another quite easily. And so the thing that I really look to is history and really looking at all the ways in which people have harmed each other and why people have done those things. Because there is a reason behind why people do those things. And then I reflect on how I harm myself as a result. Because we do that. When we do this work and we're not taking care of ourselves, that's doing harm to us, right? When we do this work and we're not assessing all along the way, that's doing harm to us. And in effect, it's doing harm to the people that we want to serve, right? That we want to help. And so, uh, in a very short way, this is really just about, you know, being in a space where the Strand has 18,000 books or whatever it is, right? That's their line. Uh, what's that? Is it 18 miles? Was... Sad. Yeah, I know. That should, be, that should be on a bag. I'll carry that. Uh, but this is, this is just it, we have access, right? It's just a matter of, are we taking the time to really examine that? One example that I give is actually King James, right? The first, formerly King James VI of Scotland. Uh, before he takes over for Elizabeth at her death, there's a lot of colonial complications there. But um, it's important to note that when he was in utero, in his mother's womb, uh, her husband at the time, took her assistant, a male assistant, I believe he was Italian, and stabbed him something like 56 times in front of her while she was pregnant with James. And when we think about the science now, and we understand what trauma looks like even in utero, right? When cortisol levels, stress levels rise up in a mother's body, it also affects who? The child. And so thinking about all the policies that have ever been made to affect all of the citizens in the landscape who don't have that kind of power, how that is also branched out of trauma, right? And so thinking about the work that we do and really taking a much longer lens. We can't just do the cross-section thing because that's what's killing us all. We have to look longitudinally because it just keeps cycling over and over again because we don't dig far enough, 
right? And that's really part of the work and why it's so important to connect with other people who are digging too. Because the hole gets a lot deeper much faster when you got more shovels, hands, you know, feet, whatever you, spoons. You know, I found out that the London Underground, when they were digging the tunnel underneath the River Thames, they had dudes in cages with spoons, literally with spoons, just like digging the wall of the dirt, right? But they did that. It took a really long time, but it happened. And as ridiculous as that sounds, it's like we all should get a spoon and start digging. And as overwhelming as it seems, it doesn't mean that there might not be some outcome in the next generation or the generation after that. Does that make sense? Maybe? Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs>